Dr. Lee, let's move on to our next topic, which is on harnessing emerging technologies to build a sustainable future. So uh, as a visionary in emerging technologies, you've overseen investments in quantum computing, microelectronics, and advanced manufacturing. So um, as a visionary in these emerging technologies, how do you see emerging technologies contributing to a sustainable future? And are there specific areas you find particularly promising? Yes, yes. I mean, by, by definition, uh, deep tech uh, slash emerging technologies, there, there are many definitions to it, but basically it's a frontier technologies. But uh, I think inherently they, they mean um, making, making things more productive, uh, you know, when you embrace innovation. And that by definition would definitely uh, reduce the carbon footprint when you do things more productively and more intelligently, right? So uh, that's that's why Singapore, you know, loves loves to embrace uh, innovation. Um, we always strive to be more and more productive because uh, we don't really have natural resources. It's, uh, so we just depend on our human capital, and so uh, our investment into technology is always at, at the top of mind. Yeah. Um, so and that ties in with sustainability, right? Um, so once again, if if my first example of investing into driver, driverless cars, um, it, it frees up a lot of resources, it frees up a lot of land space, right? S Singapore, uh, I mean, don't quote me, but I think we have devoted more than 10% of our land to, to roads, right? We, we can't keep building more roads, right? So if you embrace autonomous uh, driving, uh, then you don't really need to uh, dedicate too much uh, scarce space, land, to building more roads, more car parks, because by nature, if the car is autonomously driving around, then it doesn't need to park, right? And then you free up a lot of valuable land. So that's, that's one example of, you know, trying to be sustainable. Uh, it, it, in fact, um, uh, you know, when I spoke to the Ministry of Transport, they also have, they were also looking into urban air mobility. So translation of flying cars, it's still pretty uh, much a work in progress, but that, that will also release even more land space, right? Just imagine um, flying cars don't really need roads, right? Yeah. But I, I believe that's more um, um, country to country because uh, if, if you can fly within, um, now right now the battery life is being constrained by the battery life. So as battery technologies keep improving, then uh, you can increase the range of the electric vehicle um, so, you know, neighboring countries and Singapore would have uh, more um, interaction through, through the logistics of having uh, air flights, air passengers, air cargo, right, within a 30 minute, 30 minute radius. So we're talking anything about 400 km radius. So even rural areas which have no roads can be reachable. Right, so just imagine you don't need to spend a lot of money building uh, roads into rural places. You, you can have an amazing you know, uh, house that is off-grid and then you can just fly there and then you fly in, right, all within 30 minutes. So, so that's another idea of sustainability. Um, and even for Singapore, you know, after or during the pandemic, we all realized that even supply chains are important. Food, uh, you know, the sources of our food is important and then Increasingly, you know, we also like to know, you know, what we are eating and how it's being delivered to us. Um, and uh, then there's a lot of push by the Singapore Food Agency to, to make sure that they have this tagline, uh, 30 by 30, which means 30% uh, of Singapore's nutritional needs by the year 2030. Um, so, yeah, what do we do? So uh, when I spoke to them, I said, oh, we really need to figure out how to grow our own food. And say, in Singapore, we, we don't really have enough land to grow our own food. Is that, you know, how about things like vertical farming, uh, um, you know, recyclable aquaculture systems to grow into to the fish farms, basically. But, you know, how, how do we grow our own fish? Um, and even how do we grow our own meat in labs? So Singapore is the first ever country to allow the commercialization of uh, uh, lab-grown meat. Yeah. So uh, we, we did invest in some of these uh, companies. Uh, the breakthrough recently came when they figured out how to synthesize some um, growth hormone or growth compound. I mean, it's, it comes from the, it's the bovine serum. It comes from young calves. 
but has been since then synthesized, so there's no need to use the, the serum coming out from young calves. So with that, you can then uh, start scaling up and, and growing meat in labs, and hopefully that, that, that would be something that's palatable. So that's one thing about science, yes, it, it makes sense, you, you can grow meat in labs, but then next thing is to, you know, maybe figure out whether the public, you know, really accepts eating uh, lab-grown meat. But uh, very, very sustainable, because uh, to, to rear a cow, uh, you, have, you need acres and acres of grassland, you need swimming pools of water just to grow one cow and only to slaughter it, which, uh, which is not nice to some people who, you know, don't believe in yeah, killing. Um, so there's also the ethical part of it, right? But if you can just grow meat in labs, then you, you can be very, very sustainable and the carbon footprint, the amount of resources you use is, is much, much less. So yeah, I mean, Singapore by definition, because we lack natural resources, and by definition, then we focus on all kinds of technological innovations. We'll be a very highly sustainable country by, by default. Yeah, we always have to seek all these productive technologies. Yeah. All right, thank you. So um, that was a very insightful discussion on like how Singapore prioritizes productivity as well as food security because of our challenges mm -hmm. and how there are multiple solutions which you can use to create a sustainable future for Singapore. So on to the next question. So with a diverse background into the various fields they invest in, such as like quantum computing and microelectronics and, and manufacturing as well. So how do you envision the convergence of all of these fields shaping the technological landscape in the coming decade? Wow, yeah. That, um, yes, technologies are definitely converging. Um, take for instance, uh, semiconductors. Singapore has always been a semiconductor hub and it's always moving up and up the, the, the value chain. So I think it started its days as a, you know, we embraced disk drives, right? Um, yes, disk drives actually used to be mechanical uh, spinning disks with, you know, uh, but then eventually now we have moved on to solid state uh, ROMs and RAMs, right? There's no moving parts. And then all the uh, disk drive industry has, you know, gone and moved on to either Thailand or Malaysia, which is great. I mean, it benefits everyone. Um, that's just, so in the past, you can just silo everything, you know, yeah, this is semiconductor. And, and at the most, you can say that then it spins off precision engineering industry. So it's very, very well defined. But you fast forward to the present, I think it's, it's all kinds of technologies and different industries are all kind of merging. You need to be multidisciplinary. So um, even though my PhD was in semiconductors, I find it now being utilized in uh, you know this recent trend of uh, AI. Thanks to you know, yes, I'm sure you have been following the Open AI saga and um, Chat GPT. But then if you dig deep enough, it also comes back to uh, semiconductor technology, right? With without the knowledge of uh, of uh, developing and designing a chip, right? Um, then you wouldn't enable cloud computing, which requires all these GPU chips, right? And then you wouldn't be able to, you know, have uh, such a great tool like ChatGPT, for example. So knowledge in semiconductors is very important. Of course, then you have to marry it with knowledge in programming, and knowledge in uh, large language models, which is very interesting, but could only happen as the computational speed of these hardware chips keep improving, for example. And then you can start, now you can use these AI LLM models. Uh, uh, frankly, I, I find the most um, useful uh, use of uh, LLM right now is in healthcare industry, right? Because uh, you can have a highly trained specialist in say heart, right? So then he needs about a few hours to look at an echocardiogram, which is taking an ultrasound of your heart to figure out what's wrong with your heart. But if it's complemented by an AI to, who can straight away pinpoint that, oh, there's probably something wrong in this echocardiogram. But you need the specialist to zoom in and say, oh, yes, you're right. So it's a win-win for everyone. The, the patient gets diagnosed much faster. The specialist can see many more patients without any sacrifice in quality because he's just being backed up by the AI to, to, to pinpoint the problem. And so, so, you know, he sees more patients and more patients get detected much earlier. 
so e everyone wins, right? So so that's when you have um, the whole confluence of different technologies coming in, right? You you, you need to be a good um, medical doctor. You also need to know the existence of these AI tools, and then behind the scenes, you also need to know that the, these are semiconductor chips that are powering it, right? So so you have a marriage of uh, you know many many different disciplines. Same same with like the autonomous car that I just mentioned. Not only do you need to know how to manufacture a car, um, you also need in in a smart car, autonomous car. Um, you have you have actually uh, yeah. I'm not trying to promote Nvidia, but you have Nvidia GPUs in the car, right? Uh, open up the the boot, or you look at the bottom, and they they found a way to insert a, a couple of GPUs there to all the to do all the computational uh, requirements real time. Because yeah, it, you you can put it into the cloud, but then there's a latency, and then you know it can't react that fast. But so it's multi multidisciplinary as well. And then there are things like the sensors. Um, it's not all software. You need the lidar sensors, and then what? What is lidar? You know, it's this these things that shoot out uh, uh, beams of lasers, and then it gets reflected. Then you know, actually know the distance uh, of the object from the car. So these lidar sensors uh, actually used to be in this R and D scientific realm, state of the art things that originated from the military, but now it's on every single autonomous uh, vehicle. So you, you need to know multidisciplinary things. And then even for the cars, they tend to be electric now. Then there's a lot of battery technology. That means your material science knowledge, your chemical engineering, you need to be very good in that as well, right? So yes, we are in a world where it helps to be multidisciplinary. So keep learning. Ne never just think that, oh, I, I only want to study maths. I only want to study physics, but th there's more to it. Yeah. And then beyond that, you also need to understand how human beings think, you know, so welcome to the corporate world. It's like, why is it the um, VHS was adopted over Betamax, or maybe that's a bad example. Um, more, more present is uh, probably, I need to think of a good example. Uh, uh, why why RISC-5 uh, open source chip design is, is not as widely used as maybe um, some other proprietary uh, chip design software, and, you know, then then you need to understand that actually sometimes there's the corporate uh, uh, reasons on why certain technologies are adopted over others, right? Like why, why is Microsoft Office still the number one uh, software tool that's being used in, in, you know, in, in the corporate world, for example? You know, there are other types of software out there that is just as easy to use, but they don't seem to be as popular, for example, right? So sometimes it's not just technology as well. So you, you also need to have a bit of uh, um, business uh, knowledge on why things are the way they are. So, um, but yeah, uh, I think it's an exciting world. Um, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm 52 years old and I'm still learning, you know, like blockchain was the most recent uh, technology that comes from it's, it's not it's not all about crypto uh, but cri blockchain is actually a very useful tool that is multidisciplinary it can be used for many industries to to track land title deeds uh, electronic medical records uh, you you name it because it, it is we, we were talking about uh, immutable distributed ledger of records just about any industry requires that right so it's not just crypto Thank you, Dr. Lu. I found it very interesting how mm. like the technological field has like progressed into one where the marriage and amalgamation of like different a uh, knowledge from like different sectors is like key to success in the field, making it like imperative for like us to like partake in like multidisciplinary learning to like remain competitive and uh, relevant in like today's uh, uh, economic field. Okay.